How's it going everybody? Thank you for joining us on today's video, a special video to me. Uh, we're going to be doing an interview with Andy on kind of an origins of East County Guns as a whole. So, just kind of hanging out, smoking some cigars, and learning a little bit of backstory. I think the backstory is good. Um, yeah, I'm interested. Uh, I'm going into this green. I told him not to prep me any of the questions, so this should be this should be good. Completely blind. So. Completely blind. Yeah. Um, I want to learn a little bit more about what made you get into this. Uh, was guns for you a dream, or was it more of a hobby that kind of just fell into place? What were you doing before starting up East County Guns? Uh, I would I would say it was a hobby. Uh, for years, um, and in my previous career, um, I was involved the last five or six years a lot with firearms and guns, just as a hobby and a shooter and a collector. And then, um, when I quit, I moved. I moved back to my hometown in Elma for my previous career uh, in '98, and there was uh, several sporting goods stores um, in Olympia. There's a place called Larry's Guns. Larry's subsequently is gone. He's passed away, um, and I would say that Larry's was a, he was an icon in Olympia. Man, for a long time, um, Larry was still alive when I got my FFL in 2000. So um, I had developed a relationship with him. He was a solid guy. Um, a couple shops in Centralia, you know. Uh, my cousin and I made the uh, the loop. I mean, for years before I got married, you know, it was just part of a. And I see it's interesting because I see the I see customers and I say kids, you know, now like for me, you know, my cousin and I would we schedule our day off together and we would go clear to Tacoma and hit the pawn shops and the gun shops. We had like these routes um, and we'd go to these different gun shops and we were both the annoying guy coming in and just asking the dumb shit questions or just weirdo stuff or just, you know, not knowing any better or, you know, just learning, I guess, but... Eager. Eager, yeah. Um, and so it was just decades of that. Um, and then I got married, you know, life goes along and had some kids and, you know, that kind of changed a little bit. I still kind of kept guns on the forefront, but... Um, uh, there was a point, 99 probably, I had uh, uh, catastrophic customer service experiences, I would say, out of a shop um, over the course of a couple of weeks trying to get this issue solved and I was, uh, it was just beyond frustrated and beyond, uh, man, I was really disappointed, I was frustrated. Um, and it was just a multifaceted problem. And at the end of it, the, the guy was just like, you know what, pound sand, whatever, you're, you're done. And now, now bear in mind, I had spent, in my opinion, a decent amount of money. You know, it was probably three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000. But to me, that was a lot, you know, ninety eight, ninety nine. So I was expecting a little bit of quarter to be given. And I had come home and I was just, I was disappointed and angry about the situation. And I was, I was out $1,700. And Carla's like, you know what, this, she's like, this can't be that hard. You know, why don't, why don't you just do that instead? Hmm. And so I did a little bit of digging. I figured out it was not that easy to, or not that hard, excuse me, to apply and get an FFL. So. And this is, at this point, you're trying to figure out the space in which you're going to occupy. You know, are you. Well, I really had no concept on it at all. Like I had no idea on what was involved with the paperwork. I had no idea what was involved with the licensing. Um, Buying inventory, selling inventory, custom, I mean the whole thing. I had i had a pretty vast knowledge on retail um, and inventory management and profit and loss and from a business perspective because that's what I've been doing for 20 years before that. So I had a good concept on uh, the mechanics of it, but not, and I was somewhat familiar with the product, but not necessarily the minutia of, of putting the two together, I should say. Which is 90% of the job now you know. Yeah, it really is, uh, and that's you know we talk about this, and we put out a hiring video a while ago. So you know, I, a lot of people think that you know they see that they see that nine to five in the front end of the gun shop and and playing with guns, and you know it's just a. And we talk about this when we hire people. You know, it's not it's enjoyable, and it has its moments definitely, but more of it is involved with the back end because somebody's got to clean the toilets and somebody's got to dump the garbage and. Somebody's got to check and freight and put prices on stuff and tag stuff, and that's just you know that's that's just is what it is. Still a retail job, so it's a retail job at the end of the day, yeah. So I and I will comment on that. A lot of um, I shouldn't say a lot. I see people get into this and they get an FFL as a hobby. I want to sell guns. I want to be a gun dealer and I want to have fun. And the vast majority of I would say hobby FFLs don't 
they don't have the the depth of knowledge with the other stuff. I mean, getting an FFL and getting a serial number in and then selling a serial number out and making X amount of dollars is, but there's just so much more to it than that. I mean, it's it's pretty involved as you're well aware, so. So this, uh, these lessons you were learning were out of the garage of your house? It was, yeah, I did it, uh, I did it out of my garage for probably three years, I think. Um, I was back over in Elma um, and I had found an old, an original clipboard when I was doing the gun shows. Um, we did the, the WAC show out of Puyallup and we did the Lewis County gun show, um, you know, weekend, weekend, then a couple weekends off and packing up all your stuff and going to the tables and doing all that. And I built customers and uh, built relationships, but yeah, I mean, it was in a space not much bigger than a eight by 10 space in the garage. And that was kind of the beginning of the internet and the beginning of gun broker when that was kind of turning um, Turn the corner. It was turning the corner. Yeah, people were. It was the beginning of people getting more active on that. So. So besides volume, I I know a little bit of this uh, story, and you can share as much of it as little as you want. But I think it's it's an interesting hiccup that not a lot of home or hobby FFLs think of. But you want to share kind of the story that you told us about the main reason why you took it out of your garage. Yeah. So. Uh, this would have been probably 2002, early 2003. Um, and you may not know this, but FFLs, um, that database with names, addresses, and numbers are, it's provided by the ATF to a lot of different people. It goes out on the phone books, search directories. It's, it's pretty much all over the place. So I had two separate instances, and I want to say one was on a 4th of July. It's a long time ago but you know, having a barbecue in your backyard and people on the deck and visiting and then the side gate opens and a couple guys just walk around the side gate on the 4th of July like, hey, is this the gun shop? It really takes a turn with your wife and your small children and your friends and your dad. You're in the middle of flipping some burgers and they wanna. Yeah, so that kinda, that kinda rubbed her, uh, and rightfully so, it kind of rubbed her off because it is an invasion of space. And anybody, and I would tell anybody right now, if you're thinking about an FFL, do not do it out of your home address because as much as you want to protect that address, um, sooner or later somebody's going to find you on the internet and they're just going to, for whatever reason, they're just going to show up like, hey, can I, can I come in and buy some guns from here or look at some stuff? And the reality is it's your private space. So if you're comfortable with that, then I would say uh, do it. But for me and my wife, it was... It was no go. And you didn't have extra burger patties. And I had no extra food, so that was the other problem with that too. Um, the second instance, so this was pretty soon after that, I had a guy come down from Alaska, or he was from Alaska, and he had attempted to purchase a shotgun, got delayed, he left. Um, Alaska State Patrol called, wanted to get this information. They called local law enforcement, and they wanted me to bring this guy back so they could pinch him. And we went down this whole conversation. I'm like, I, I'm you're not, trying to sell a shotgun. Now you're part of a sting operation. I can't, because eventually this guy's going to get out, right? And he knows where I live. So you know, I never, I, I gave him the information, which I'm obligated to provide. But you were going to, you know, I, I, I told her this, and she's, yeah, that was, that was it. I took a hunting trip with a guy named Jack. Um, we came over and shot some coyotes in February, so it would have been January, February, probably in Washington. And and when I came back, she's like, hey, I, I lease a space downtown. You got. My wife evicted me <laughs> from the garage. I had 60 days to get out. <laughs> she didn't want yeah. that. She didn't want it around the house. She didn't want it around the kids. And that's and, and rightfully so. It's it's it was unreasonable of me at that point in my life to expect that to be good. Right. You you didn't plan that far ahead. You just knew I was going to sell guns, and and this is the space that I'm doing it right now. Yeah, I think uh, got that lighter. Uh, I I don't think I fully thought. Again, that's just one of those things. You get in there and you've got to deal with the situation where people get denied, you know, or delayed or whatever, and it happens. It, ha it happens here. It happens in Washington. It happens all over the place. And this, you know, whether it's right or wrong or whatever, but it's it can create it can create problems. I think it's back to that minutia that you were talking about before, where not a lot of hobby stores can plan for that. You know, you don't know mm -mm. the finer details or you know the the little like idiosyncrasies of oh like you know the right. conditions of if this then that like until you're in that moment and you're right yeah you're I mean, the, the, the ATF's not going to sit down and tell you like hey you're going to sell a thousand guns but on gun 847 the guy's going to get a deny right. and law enforcement's going to contact you 
You can't plan for that. And you've, yeah, you've just got this whole thing now. Now that guy's angry, but he's not angry at the ATF or the state patrol. He's angry at you because you're telling him no. You're the target. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're, you're, you're the, the guy. You're telling me no. <laughs> yeah. This is unconstitutional. Yeah. You know, I'm a sovereign citizen. And whatever the, whatever <laughs> they got going on in their brain, it's like, you know, we're I, I'm we're obligated because you're on my license too to follow the rules and protocols of of how this all goes. So it doesn't matter if we agree with them or not. We are doing a job that. It's like it's like OSHA regulations, you know. Like you got to be tight on that. It's a job. Yeah, yeah right. It's, it's a job. So if it's if it's a hobby and you're doing it for fun and you've got a regular nine to five and you got medical and dental insurance, you know, have at it. You're you're not you don't have that much at risk, I guess, of something. Hard hats could be uncomfortable for you, but because it's part of the job and the safety, you got to wear it. But if you if you fully committed to this and and this is it, and for me this is it, I, I'm all in. So okay. I, I don't have anything to fall back on. So I have to be. I've got to be tight. Yeah. So. So you get back from hunting, you're like, man, I got skunked. Or maybe you didn't, mm -hmm. uh, and you t turn to find out, you like, you got kicked out. You're in a different dorm room now. You got, a, you got your own lease space. So were you, were you more excited in that? Were you kind of like, oh shit, this is, this is real now? No, I think, I mean, we were probably ready at that point, and I was still, you know, I think any new business going into that, no matter what you're coming from, whether it's a restaurant business or you know, selling whatever, you know, you go into it with expectation and you are undercapitalized and you're under, you know, you're going into that thinking I can do this and run pretty skinny and thin. So I would say that on any small business coming away from A and going to B and trying to be conservative or aggressive or whatever, you're, you're no matter whatever number you think you need to do this, you need more. Yeah. And I don't think, um, and this is our third location in Coeur d'Alene. And even when I thought that was enough, it still wasn't enough. Yeah. You know, so I learned a lot in that first seven, eight years, nine years in Elma with inventory and managing lots of ups and downs and lots of problems and, you know, learning and working through that. And then when we did the Centralia store, which I think was in 16, uh, it got better. Yeah. You know, because I had, I had a track record. I knew what to expect. I knew going into that how long it's going to take to put the floors in, to paint it, hang the walls, get the cases in, get a walk. I mean, I had a, a I had a timeline. I had a better timeline on how that was going to go. Yeah, and and then I took that information obviously and came here, and it's it's getting better and more efficient. And I I will say when we build our four store, it will be even it will be even better and it'll be more efficient. I have a better idea, yeah. um, and starts would, to blueprint itself out. You know, I've been here before. This is what yeah I it, yeah. It'll be less. It'll be more stuff that's familiar and less stuff that's unfamiliar. Yeah. So before we get too far from the first store, uh, and kind of your early inception and things. You mentioned early web traffic. What uh, what did that look like? Early 2000s, you know, you're, you're innovating in, in gun shows, but you're also trying to branch out into internet sales. What did early internet sales look like? Boy, that's a good question. Um, you know, guns.com wasn't around at the time. Uh, I don't think Guns America was. Gun Broker, I would say, was probably the most dominant, uh, the most dominant website. And then obviously just the website itself. So having a website which I designed and it was just hot garbage, <laughs> you know, because uh, I'm not a programmer, I'm not, you know, but web designer, yeah. you know, taking some HTML codes and kind of crippling it together and making links and, you know, I could do that and I could, I figured out how to put photos in and, and links and, you know, some sort of bullshit shopping cart and stuff too. I could kind of chop my way through it. And, but, I, you know, come to find out it's just better to pay somebody that does this for a living <laughs> right. um, and make it look better. But, um and it may still be out right now. There's a thing called search engine optimizations or keyword placements. So you could pay, uh, in an example, I would say like uh, Socko rifles and Tico rifles. I could, you could pay for clicks to get up onto the top. There are people selling positioning on the websites. So if you searched for Socko varmint rifle, you could pay for a position to come up on the first, second, or third listing on, on the web. Um, you know, whether it was 15 cents or 20 cents, and there was like, people were bidding against each other. It was like this whole sub-business, and it may still be out there right now, because, but you could pay search engines, you could get up to the top, that would drive internet traffic to the website, and guys would call, and man, I sold a ton of stuff, you know, and shipped a ton of stuff. So, um, lots of packing, lots of shipping, lots of lots of that. Which is something we still do today. I mean, it's, it's really cool to hear how you, again, kind of like you said, cobbled together some things that are really instrumental in what we do on our daily life. Like we still ship guns and, you know, 
Gunbroker and now Guns.com, and it's it's cool to see, like you mentioned, when building stores, you know, each time you do it, it gets a little bit easier. Yeah, and we're paying uh, we're paying a company now, Gearfire, and there's a whole that's a whole other thing. Gearfire is taking is taking our websites, is taking inventory, and then populating the site with that. Which you're you're familiar. We're running into problems with that occasionally. Guys will come in and say, "I saw this on the website, you know, and it says you got 860 units," and that's like, well, we wish. That'd yeah, cool. not not really. We may have 800 <laughs> guns total, but we don't have 800 of just that model. That'd be a whole train car load of it. So because it's available in a warehouse and you know some other locations. So. Um, and the website traffic kind of comes and goes, so I don't know if that's indicative with you know inflation of the market or you know whatever. So ebbs and flows, like most things in, in any industry, really, but especially the guns. It seems like gun industry. We have made the joke in the shop where it's, it's almost like dog years, where you know one one year in dog year in gun years is you know, I mean vastly exponential to just a standard year because what comes out at shot show two years ago is, is essentially has a chance of being completely irrelevant in just a two year span of time. I mean, the the market, for example, we sell a lot of suppressors in our store. The market on that alone, I mean, new technology is coming out all the time, even in the last couple of years, even in Coeur d'Alene only. Since yeah. 2019, the, the market is just exponential growth. Uh, I was just talking to Trevor about this in Washington, too, because he's, he's seeing an uptake in it as well. And what we're noticing here as well, people are people that have bought suppressors now that are shooting suppressors, and they share that with their friends. And then those, it's created this, and it's just new. I think it's new and exciting. Um, and ironically, it's been available since like 1936, so it's not like it's it's not it's, new technology. It's not new technology, and I would I would venture to say, and I haven't heard it in the last couple of weeks, but on a regular basis, people come in. Well, you can't sell those; they're illegal. So oh, illegal or yeah, yeah. That's my favorite. That's probably my favorite thing. Like, well, not no, not really. No, <laughs> and you just shh. It's not yeah, illegal. Yeah, uh, so it's not illegal. <laughs> so you mentioned you know web traffic, uh, gun shows. We don't really do that anymore. What kind of what was the the change, I guess, in your perspective on going and doing gun shows? Was it was it more time than it was worth, or was it just you know an allocation of resources that you didn't have? I, both. Um, so I had a I still have a good friend of mine, Dave, um, and we would get three tables. You know, they'd be eight footers, um, and I had these carpets. I actually still have those camouflage carpets floating yeah. around. I laid all these carpets out. I was I liked the presentation. I had banners made. I still had the original banner floating around and. You know, I had laid the rifles out and do all that, but you've got to you've got to pack all that up, make price tags. You know, however, you know I can remember handwriting stuff on little Manila cards with a sharpie. My handwriting is not great, and just you know trying to make this trying to make this display. You know, so for years, you know, packing up 50, 60 handguns while you're building inventory. So could you imagine packing a quarter of the store, just putting it in boxes in a car, and driving in some place, and then unpacking it? No, thank you. Right, I, res I respect the guys, and then doing and then it, chaining it all up at night because it's got to stay on the table. You're not going to pack it all up, so it's going to stay in this building, and you don't have hands on. And I never had a problem, thank God. But you know, it's at it's at the goddamn fairgrounds <laughs> with a bunch of cowboys. Not there's anything wrong with cowboys next door riding horses, and you know you got twenty five thousand dollars worth of product on the table, and it's just like it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's and then on top of that, it's at a gun show, and then you tell the guy, "Well, I'm an FFL. You got to do the paperwork anyway." Like, I didn't want to do paperwork. I'm, that's why I came to the gun show. I wanted to spit and shake hands. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, yeah. it's it's an interesting market, and it's, I feel like what I enjoy so much about you know working in the gun shop and working with you is there's not really a boring day. I mean, there's always something, whether good or bad. There's always something to overcome or learn with. And uh, as far as I mean, you're 25 years in. Um, two th uh, 23, I guess, would be 2000. So 23 would be 23 years, yeah. So I guess on that note, what... Uh, it would be 24 years, I guess, probably March, probably. Next, coming up? Yeah. So what keeps you, besides the necessity of it, what keeps you coming back? What makes you excited to just continue this? I mean, you start, literally, you started this out of your garage. What? What's, I guess, the fuel for you? 23 years in. That's a good question. Um, we can come back to it at the end too, but it's a good thing to think about. No, I, I, I had this conversation with, um, it's easy to say it's, you know, I'm making a living out of it, which I am. Um, Gabe just bought a house out of Centrea and that makes me excited. Sam's bought a house. Um, Trevor needs to buy a house, but he won't. You're buying a house. You know, Connor here's buying a house. Um, I'll tell you what brings me back is 
and this sounds stupid or corny or however you want it to sound, I, I want to I want to make sure that I have employees that are working, that it's sustainable and it's, you know, it's part of my responsibility as an owner to provide you guys. I mean, it's a, it's an, it's a, maybe an unspoken agreement that you're going to be gainfully employed. You know, you, I don't want you to worry. I mean, we're all, I worry about, you know, ATF and audits and all that crap, but, um, I want to make sure that my guys are, I want to make sure my guys are good. Mm -hmm. So. If my guys are good, then I'm good. Yeah, I mean, I, that's something that I'm I'm learning the value of the most because I started out, I guess, one of the main things I was excited about for this interview process, and again, Andy went into a blind, was back in 2019, beginning of 2019, uh, he hired me on, and we went down to this little coffee shop in Centralia. Right. And I'd been a customer of East County Guns for, I mean, since they opened pretty much in 2016. And a couple things kept bringing me back was it didn't matter if I was buying a $14 part or a $50 part or the guy next to me was buying a $5,000 gun. I was treated the exact same. Uh, so I think what you touched on earlier about, you know, you mentioned like, well, I felt like in my mind, I felt like I spent enough money there. Like, I think it's really cool that you have cultivated an environment that I really don't feel like anybody is self-conscious about the money they spend in the shop. So customers- In our footprint. In, right, so you've built this. So that's what drew me in was, I knew that if I bought a $14 part, you guys were just as happy to have me in that building. And well, that's, I, I that's think, what kept me coming back. I think that goes back to, well, it goes back to previous some customer service issues too. And I will say, uh, I have a strong personality, I will say that. And I am probably not for everybody. Um, but I would like to say, or I'd like to think that at least, you know, at the end of the day, anybody can sell guns, really. You can get an FFL, you can rent a space, you can do your thing and sell guns and stuff. But that's really, you know, you can come around Coeur d'Alene or Lewis County or Grace Harbor and the guns are all going to be, you know, it's, yeah, it's not like this huge swing on the prices. Um, you're, um, you're paying for customer service or you're paying because of the environment or, or the, it's, a, it's, it's friendly and nice. Now, again, I'm, sometimes I'm not the greatest. Um, and I've had some run-ins and stuff too. So that's, I think that's just the, the cost of doing business, you know, in retail. Um, or people. And, yeah, we're just dealing with people and stuff too. So um, at the end of the day, everybody's, everybody has good days, everybody has bad days, so. Yeah. But, you know, in this seated position going on five years working for you, it was really cool to, to grow and to watch, you know, coming over from Western Washington, you, you had me come over to help with open up the Idaho location. Yeah. And it's really interesting to see now, essentially full circle or semi-circle, because we're far from being done, but to sit in the same configuration in the <laughs> original interview, yeah. uh, you know, you can't imagine that. And I think a testament to what you're building is, I never expected to buy a house, you know, as early as I did or, expected to even plan for these things and it's because of again what you start out of your garage That's well I, I would hope the stability it's it's stability and i think that stability translates rather than i mean i think it translates to you and to you know our guys and everybody the stability creates stability yeah so i agree yeah um we we touched on you know a little bit of centralia we've mentioned it a couple of times but i kind of want to hear more details about you know, Carla got the lease for Elma, but yeah. how did it look for Centralia? I mean, you know, you're, you're at what point in the decision making process did you realize, oh, well, I, I need a second store? You know, what what was the tipping point to that? Uh, we had we had customers coming from Elma. Now, if you're not familiar with Western Washington, that drive is probably 45, 50 minutes. Um, and Elma, if you look on the map, is, is about 35 minutes from Aberdeen, 30 minutes from Shelton, 30 minutes from Olympia, and about 30, 40 minutes to Centralia, which I didn't plan for any of that. It just worked out, but it happens to be a good distance between four major hubs. Mm -hmm. But we had a lot of traffic, uh, and we looked at Olympia too. But the real estate prices and stuff, um, and the population and bed counts and some other stuff. You know, Centralia, Centralia, Chehalis, Lewis County just had. It was more appealing, um, and we had a decent amount of customers coming out of Lewis County, um, and it just seemed like it just seemed like a natural fit. Uh, and the Olympia market, honestly, was a lot more competitive. Um, Larry had passed away already, so Larry was gone, and it got bought by some other guys at Cascade 
um, which just turned out to be a giant train wreck. And you guys can Google that and figure out what happened with Cascade Arms. But that was a mess um, with those guys. There was a lot of guys that got really hosed when that thing folded up. So, um, for those of you that don't know, Centralia is prime real estate because it's essentially the gas station that everybody stops at between Portland and Seattle. It's pretty much equidistant between the two major cities. Over, over exit. I think we're at exit seventy-seven. I think. Something like that. But yeah, it's, it's yeah. the gas station everybody stops at. So it's it's kind of a good hub, like you said. Southern hub. Yeah, and we're in the we're in the historic district. So we're downtown on Tower, um, and it's a historic district. So, um, you know, when the weather's nice and car shows and traffic and the restaurants and the bars are all down there, it's a, it's a decent it's amount amazing. of, yeah, it's a decent amount of foot traffic in that, in that core area. So, yeah. So. That was what, and what I had an opportunity to buy the building. That was the other thing. So. Um, my dad had said wisely, you know, don't don't put a ton of money into something if you can't if you can't own the dirt. That's like if you're not gonna, if you don't own the dirt, man, you're 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 paying somebody else's mortgage. So that's a good point. Yep. So we had an opportunity to do that. So that was the other thing we were able to get into the property and and buy it. So so now you went from leasing to property owning in, right. in a second store. Right. What um. I guess that's kind of a pro and con right there is, you know, you're your own landlord and you are your own contract, but at the same time when things go south, uh, it's on you, like you're fixing it. Yeah, 100%, we just had to put a roof on, actually. <laughs> so yeah, I do get that. Uh, we do lease in the quarter lane location because there's just no way, you know, the Idaho market, the square footage would be uh, astronomical. I'm not even sure that would be, you know, property in town here, as you're well aware of, it's just, it's crazy. So we made a decision to lease here, um, and the trade-off being we're not going to own the dirt, but um, the position there in government with the businesses and stuff around there was really, it was worth the trade, I think. We switched places because somebody got cold. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I want a professional interview here. I don't want to be shaking like a chihuahua. Yeah. Uh, so a funny story about the roof replacement. <laughs> I used to, you know, like you said, you were doing the rounds with your buddies and your cousins and all that. That's That was my my thing. And before I get into the funny story, part of, again, what drew me back to East County Guns was they were the first gun shop that treated me like I had something to learn rather than I didn't know anything. So that was, that was huge for me. So I was like, well, yeah, I'm going to come back here and probably loiter way too much, but I did it. Uh, and one of the funny memories was I came in one day and there was just a huge section of the wall just free of guns. I was like, whoa, you guys have like a fire sailor in here or something? And Connor uh, at the time was like, no, son. a water sail. I was like, what? He's like, check it out. And the, the light fixture was just full of water. Yeah. It was a, uh, it was significant amount of damage. Yeah. We had an insurance claim on that one. It, it's the, the, the mildewy iron water from the roof gun on about two dozen guns and oh. it jacked a bunch of stuff up. It was there was like a Chris Vector there and Antenna X. It was a bunch of stuff. Of course, like it was like an expensive section. Yeah, over the weekend, it was really gross. So yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. Actually, that's funny. Yeah. So I want to I want to touch on that about about that, and I'll go back to this other gun shop in the beginning. Um, and I, I had several instances coming in there, so. And gun shops and stuff can be opinionated and there can be a vibe in there and, I, and I'm sure that anybody that's gone into several gun shops there's like a, you know the feeling of the space or you know how that goes in there so I mean I had a pocket full of money I wanted an AR-15 and now this is before this is when the assault weapon ban was still in effect so what year uh, this would have been 2000 probably so I wanted an AR-223 I know I couldn't get it threaded it was going to be low cap I was shooting coyotes and I had gone with a guy that I had um, out of Moses Lake and we had been hunting uh, coyotes and stuff in Western. I was really into coyote hunting in that period of time. So, you know, I went into the shop that I've been frequenting a lot and, you know, the guy's very similar. They had chairs and it's a wood stove and they're standing around. I said, hey, I want to talk about buying an AR. And, you know, of course, everybody's like, not everybody, but, you know, like, why the, why the hell do you want that? It's, the, the peanut gallery and the chairs. The peanut, yeah, you yeah. need a, you know, yeah, you need a Remington 700 in a, in a 17 Remington or a yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, you, yeah, you can you don't need an AR-15. That's for you know hoodlums hoodlums and yeah, I'm like well That's what I want to buy right So it was just off-putting, you know, and I yeah, I chalked it up a little bit for whatever reason, but it's just Yeah, I think we, for the most part we too we do try to avoid that um, 
but even even you know this week I had somebody come in and ask for something. I said, well, uh, I can only speak to my history with this because I have history with it, and you know the customer service on this is not great. Um, and we get a twenty percent failure, fifteen percent failure, and in me, my opinion, that's too much. Um, if we sell ten units and I get two of them back, that's that's a problem. Um, that's way too high. I don't want to see one out of fifty come back. Yeah. Um, and it's not that I don't want to see you. I want to see you happy. <laughs> yeah. So you know, getting RMAs, getting returns back, the shipping both directions, dealing with the vendor. Um, back to that minutia that you can't. I'm just trying to avoid all that. Yeah. I want you to come in, have a good purchase with a good product and enjoy it and use it and just continue to do that you know not having to fight this fight this thing whether it's accuracy or feeding issues or whatever i mean that's that's no good for anybody it's just a waste of time for all of us there's never uh, a period of time with any level of property or investment that you go into it going if i have the potential to fight this like if i if it's going to be a constant uphill battle with this investment mm -hmm. any other industry or product you would just steer clear so it's interesting that we have that feedback. And we still have failures. I mean, we still have, it's like with anything else. You know, we sell, we sell a lot of aim points. We sell EOTEX. We sell a lot of Holosun, um, which has been great, but we do have some failures across the board. Now, again, there's a, a metric on that. Right. I mean, once aim point and EOTEC, we don't have a ton of problems with. Not a ton, but, you know, one or two. And the Holosun, you know, for better or for worse, if we have a problem with Holosun or Vortex, we just... They just no question. We just replace it. They're, you know, we take care of the customer. We handle it. It's done and gone. But man, some of the companies out there, like, it's like pulling teeth to try to get. You spend good money on product X, and if it's if we got to pull teeth to get you taken care of, man, that's just a that's a bad thing for everybody, in my opinion. Yeah. I don't want it. Not worth it. No. Let's pause real quick. So I want to get my list. Just want to make sure I'm staying on path. Um, do you think we've gone too far away from talking about the balancing act between Centra and Oma and the, the challenges that you face? How so? I mean, what a I, we just started talking about other stuff. I just want to make sure we can go back to it, Parker. Think we're good too? Yeah. Okay. What do you I want to talk specifically. I'll ask you. Oh, go ahead. I like I liked you having uh, the clipboard on on here. Yeah, because then you were not... looking down, but it didn't look like you. Okay, were that was my that was my goal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so you've got Centralia, you've got Elma now. Mm -hmm. uh, what, besides timing and logistics there, I guess what were some of the bigger pros and cons that you came across when, when having two stores now? I mean, you're, you're only one person, so. Well, it was, you know, it was staff. I had to, I obviously couldn't be in both places at the same time, and so it developed into this you know, this daily routine going into Elma. Um, Houston was there helping me run that sh store, um, going to Centralia. Um, and we had a couple changes with staff there. I was struggling with Centralia to keep that, you know, um, through some managers, I guess. Um, my son had graduated from college. He came to work for us. Um, but it, again, it, yeah, you're right. Just going to Elma in the morning, you know, getting some of that stuff done, getting it loaded up, getting the car, driving to Centralia, getting all that done. You know, maybe running back in the afternoon or going through Olympia to get groceries or some soup and then coming back. So it was just this constant. And it's there's nothing wrong with it. I, ironically, I actually enjoyed it. So, um, but it was a lot of a lot of car time. I mean, I spent a lot of time in the car. You know, probably three hours a, at least three hours a day. Uh, in good traffic. Yeah, in good traffic, right? And I five and you know, you know, the highway there just kept getting worse and worse. Highway twelve, you know, through Oakville and stuff is just. If you haven't drove that, it's, it can be really crappy. So. We, we wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. So so the balancing act and the drive time I think would be would be pretty significant. So now you take that and you amplify it by four hundred miles. I mean, talk a little bit about this leap into Idaho and you know Well let's go back to two thousand eighteen. Um in or late seventeen and when they're talking about uh sixteen thirty nine getting passed. So we had gotten a copy of the bill, we read through the whole thing. Um um, I got it over to my lawyer, which he's a super good, super good guy. We read through the whole thing, and there was a couple things in there that we read, and you know, I, it didn't look good, you know, for Washington State. Now this is 2017 going into 18, and there's a ton of campaigning, and there's some guys on the internet, gun shops, raising money. We're going to fight, you know, make these GoFundMe accounts, and we're going to donate and raise a bunch of money, and we're going to fight this thing, and we're going to hire legal. Ironically, a couple of guys that raised a lot of money, like 
that money just vanished and I don't know what happened to it. And I'm not going to name names, but timeshares in the Bahamas. But several uh, several people have raised a lot of money to fight this thing, and I mean it passed by a landslide. I want to say like 74 percent. Yeah, it was significant. I remember the campaigning a little bit when I joined on in 2019 because it hadn't passed yet. Because it was it was it was looming over the heads when I joined on. Yeah, it passed. It passed in November of 18. Um, and when it did, and we were uh, we were on a trip in Hawaii, and it passed. And then her and I are having a conversation like we've got a. You know, it's not that Washington wasn't going to be sustainable. It was definitely going to be different. But I wanted a, you know, for I wanted a, a position to insulate ourselves, you know, financially. If, you know, because I, I had a feeling if something started, it wasn't going to. It, they're not going to be happy. There. It's going to snowball. It's going to snowball. You give them a little bit, they're going to take a little bit more. You know, you look at Canada and some of those restrictions, or you look at California and some of those restrictions. Where, man, once you get your foot in the door on that, it's just a little bit more and a little bit more. And and ironically, you know, the last thing that happened. Um, I want to say in Washington two years ago, they killed the high capacity mag. That got passed, so no more high capacities. And then the following year, which would have been, was that this year? Yeah. Yeah, I want to say that the next one got passed, so like March of, was it this year? It was this year. So March of this year, no more assault weapons either. So we got really lucky. I talked to a really good friend of mine um, that makes steel targets, store targets. We sell them in all the stores. It's a super good product. Um, I had called Josh. We had some conversations because we looked at Oregon also. And Josh told me the same thing, you know, up and down I-5 there, it's just, it's just crap. So Portland would have been closer time-wise and distance-wise, but, you know, really looking at Oregon or looking at Idaho, this was on I-90 and like this, it just, it was 50-50 and I got lucky, really. Wow. Flipped a coin. Yes. Yeah. So, so you knew it would be impossible to make that drive as much as you were driving between the two stores yeah. so a decision tree process had been broken down for you to go okay where where am i going to plant myself to better serve the locations and well yeah i mean I do I do i want to continue to do this right so if this if this thing slowly starts to die 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 you know and i want to continue to do this work and i do this successfully so um it's going to work so, you know, I had a, I, you know, the decision tree, you know, we, I talked to Carla, I talked to our kids, you know, I talked to my folks, her folks, like how, if we're going to do all this, how do we, how do we navigate this? Because it is, you're right, it's 400 miles away, which doesn't seem like a lot maybe, but it's a bit of a drive. I mean, logistically, to even just move a household, let alone a household in the business, that's, that's quite a bit. Yeah. So I'm glad we did it. So I, I will say Idaho is a blessing. So I remember I had met you three times in person. And it was it was the week of my ninety day probationary period, <laughs> and you're like, I got an opportunity for you. You're like a recruiter. You're like, son, do I have something for you? And it was sign here, sign here. And it was the most terrifying moment because at the time I had just I hadn't even celebrated a year married yet. We got my first ever apartment. Like I, the right. lease was just up. I mean the timing was impeccable, but first ever apartment, month to month now. And you're like, hey, we'd like you to come on over, and, and you did. I, I still to this day think it was it was intentional. You were very gracious enough to put us up in a hotel to come check out Idaho for the weekend, and it was a beautiful hotel. Uh, and I was like, okay. I walk in the lobby. I'm like, okay. I see. I hear you. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but well, you're working in Centralia. I was. Yeah. So uh, I mean, some of that was self-serving because I was. I you had a you had some experience and a track record. So and, and going into Idaho, I mean, you have some pictures with me riding around the store on a pedal bike. <laughs> In yeah. the front room, you know that build out. I knew, I knew the build out. It, I think it's it's snowballed and grown. It scaled up much faster than I thought it was going to. And well, we're not even we're not even here. I think we're here five years. Nineteen. I can't do the math on that. I think it's just right at five because we're on our second renewal right now, and it's really. So the this the, is a busy location. The the funniest thing I like to tell customers in store when they're like, "Man, this is you know this place is is booming." And I'm like, oh, back in my day, like I, I remember, <laughs> I remember, um, definitely off the clock, uh, Connor and I playing full chess games in between yeah. customers because like we'd cleaned, we'd swept the same corner five times. Uh, I think at one point Connor put dust on the ground out of his pocket just so I had something to do, uh, and we were just eager. You know, you had to, you had to watch the paint dry a little bit and just but it, be it, eager each time. And it was, it's been phenomenal to have such an amazing following that we have here in Idaho and at all three locations we've all had established regulars and, and it's it's very exciting 
you know, it's interesting to see, you know, the relationships, long-term relationships. I had a guy call me from Shelton uh, today. His father passed away. We talked a little bit and, um, you know, I could remember him from, you know, eight, nine years ago we were talking to his dad. Now, I didn't know that he had passed away and, you know, he called me and we talked a little bit and, you know, it's interesting. You know, Corey came by, Yeah. you know, Corey came by the store two weeks ago. Yeah, it's oh. interesting. You know, it's like people now travel just to get the hat trick is what we've been calling it. Which yeah, the hat we're trick. gonna have to change it at some point here. But the hat trick of, of visiting all three locations and it's really cool on our perspective, especially yours having worked so long in all three stores, but like even me in Centralia, I see customers like Corey that come over and I'm like, Whoa, like Right. What's going on? And the and the relationships we've established with our customers, like they remember it and we remember them and I think that's really special. Right. All right. Yeah, the customers are special. I mean, it's yeah, it's it's very fulfilling. So, um, and we have a lot of good relationships. So, the 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 space kind of getting towards the wrapping up section here, I guess. Now that we're in Idaho in conversation and physically, how has the space transformed from when you originally envisioned opening up the Idaho location? So, you get the keys to this lease space. Has it just completely blindsided you with expectations on how? it's all shifted or is it kind of grown to about what you'd expect or what you plan for? No, it's not what I expected at all. Um, on the space wise, the square footage and I, I would say, and you've been in all three spaces, would you say, I mean, I know for square footage, Idaho's a small square footage. Um, yeah. and the businesses more than we're doing in Elma square footage, uh, in the Centralia. So we have really, we have outgrown it. I mean, it's for the, for the amount, that we're doing in that little tiny space. And there's some customers in Idaho that have been here in 19, 20, and you know, seen some adjustments that we've done and, and made it. I mean, we got a ton of stuff packed into that little tiny space. It's the equivalent of like Costco being in a tiny house, it feels like sometimes, because you know, we're, we're trying to maximize every single square inch of that uh, you know, square footage. And, and what I don't think a lot of customers know is we, our office space has been converted. It was an old, older room in there, and we've converted even that square footage to try to make some semblance of an office. So, yeah, we literally. I mean, you guys have come into the back and have some pictures taken on the back, and, and we ran out of all horizontal space now, and so we've gone up. We've got totes on top of totes with stuff just to be able to keep that inventory all I mean, safely secured. It's it's a ton of stuff. I mean, yeah. and there's probably a full pickup load of totes of just magazines. I mean, there's. <laughs> Just the magazines alone. I mean, there's a mountain of that. Yeah. So it's a lot in that space. So, so I'm grateful that the Washington customers are buying magazines and leaving them in their Idaho, Idaho vaca location. vacation homes. That's yeah. I, we love that. <laughs> uh, future plans. You talked about adding a fourth store. What does that look like to you, and um, how does that make you feel? I mean, you're nervous. <laughs> nervous. <laughs> and it's got to be just right. Um, I'm not. I'm older and wiser. I'm not forcing, you know, whether that's, um, it's gotta be just right on the space. Um, I got a, a real estate advocate uh, that's doing really well for us. We're looking at some spaces. We're just gonna, we're, it's gonna happen. We're just gonna go slow and I wanna make sure that it's gonna be done right. I don't wanna, I don't wanna get jammed up on, you know, make a quick hasty decision because it's, I, I don't wanna have to go back and redo it or move or get it or something, so. We wanna show. Well, I think, I think we need it. There's, yeah. We need to show our customers and our ourself and our staffing and, and the business itself the respect it deserves at this point to get the correct space, you know, and not to just settle. Yeah, and that's the frustrating part. I would say, you know, people um, and some customers have been in there, and we've had full staff on Friday and Saturday, and it's still not enough. I mean, we try to greet everybody and try to take care of everybody, but occasionally it's just like, I mean, you've been in there. It's just it's tough. It's yeah. so. Uh, I think I think we need we need to expand. So, I think so too. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited that you guys joined us for this video, and it's a little bit longer, but I think the origins was incredibly important to uh, the staff at East County Guns as well as hopefully the customers. And I hope that it shows some some appreciation for you that you know we want to all collectively, all of us, want to take the time to hear how you started and and how you're able to provide for us. And I know for myself. I'm incredibly thankful for the stability that you've been able to provide. And again, this just, it blows my mind to know that you started this out of a one bad interaction and out of your garage. I mean, I don't think you could have fathomed 
supporting families. I mean, plural families. So I, I no, no, yeah, you're right. No, I didn't. It was at the beginning. It was just me and Carl and the kids, and I was trying to figure out a way to. Uh, I wanted to help my kids get through college, and you know, I'm just trying to navigate this, navigate this thing, and it's. it's you're getting other kids through college. No, I'm putting other kids through yeah. college. Yes, so. It's, and uh, I don't have to go back to stripping because that did not go well. It's exciting. No, I think it's exciting. So that brings me that brings me joy. Well, thank it, you again for for joining us, guys, and I uh, hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. If you have any questions or comments, um, leave them. Socials at East County Guns. Emails working. So um, we'd love to hear what you have to say about this. So thank you. Mm -hmm.